this podcast, Andrea Gallagher from BCG talks about her journey from writing Python code to managing an analytics practice. So stay tuned. Welcome everyone to another episode of Future of Data podcast. Today we have with us Andrea Gallego, who is a principal and global technology lead at the Boston Consulting Group, where she is blending strategic and analytic and technology excellence to build world-class analytics-based solutions that deliver disruptive impact. Andrea was of Quantum Black's cloud platform. She also uh, managed uh, the cloud platform team and helps drive the vision and future of McKinsey and analytics uh, digital capabilities. Andrea has broadened expertise in computer science, cloud computing, digital transformation strategy, and analytic solutions architecture. Prior to joining the firm, Andrea was a technologist at Booz Allen Hamilton. She holds a BS in eco- economics and MS in analytics with a concentration in computing methods of for, uh, for analytics. So with that, uh, thank you, Andrea, so much for uh, for joining and, 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 and willing to to share your thoughts with our community. Yeah, thank you. It's very good to be here, Vishal. Thanks for inviting me. Awesome, awesome. I think when I was reading your bio and, and, and when I was reading sort of your profile, by the way, kudos on using all the right keywords. So it's it's <laughs> it's it's a mouthful, right? It's just like whatever you can think about uh, and whatever is critical to the industry, you are pretty much using uh, almost, uh, you have been um, touched your hands in, in one of the, like m- most of those areas. So kudos on that so why don't we start with that journey like what brought you to this point so if you can share with our audience that would be really helpful yeah it's it's um it's a long one but i'll be i'll be quick and uh, and spunky at, at it so um i started in investment banking i was at lehman brothers i interned there for a number of years while i was doing economics in school um, uh, to my to my own dismay lehman went bankrupt my first two months as a, as a banker there. Mm. <laughs> so I became very disenchanted with, with finance at that moment and kind of wanted to think of something that I could do with my degree that wasn't directly related to finance and, um, and could still give me an opportunity to open my mind to other things. And I got the unbelievable opportunity to scale a private foundation with a hedge funder and his wife. Um, and it was three, maybe five or 10 people, all PhD physicists and, and one VP that worked with, um, with this woman that, that worked with the hedge funder. And it was literally complete, you know, complete blank slate. Let's build a foundation. Let's work in math and science. And from there, let, let's go. So I did everything from soup to nuts. I helped build the databases. I went out, I developed grants. We developed a huge grant making foundation. We built schools. We helped. We went to Nepal, um, and you know, we we helped um, try to formulate a database that would um, study autism in simplex families, which are families with only one child with autism, not two siblings. And so, we just really across the board. I was there for about three and a half years. When I left, there were about seventy five people. We moved offices. The scale was enormous. Um, and I won't go into too much detail, but during all of those small bits and pieces, I realized that my passion was in um, building software and building technology that was going to solve a business use and bridging the gap between business and technology. Because a lot of the times engineers are in one small silo and executives are in another silo, and it's very hard to bridge the two. So I went back to school for analytics and computer science in Fordham. Um, and after that, uh, right, went right into Booz Allen, um, had a lot of fun in grad school, wrote a bunch of white papers, really fell in love with coding and computing. Um, and then went to Booz Allen, had a lot of fun at Booz Allen, wrote a uh, paper in sports analytics on predicting pitches out of the mount. Um, that was a ton of fun. We met a lot of good people there and then got called um, by McKinsey to, to go work as an associate at McKinsey with a bit of a technical lean and help them implement pro- projects that no longer are implementable by PowerPoint, <laughs> <laughs> which is, you know, the older management consulting. Um, and so I was there for about a year or so, 
I started using Amazon Web Services for my own my own use, and um, one of the partners asked me to scale that out. And so over the span of one to two years, we acquired Quantum Black as McKinsey, um, and I had built out our, our global analytics platform and became a COO of that piece, and then call, got called in by BCG to do something similar, just faster, bigger, and, and greater. So here I am. We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI-powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. That's fascinating. So um, let's let's talk about um, your CEO role uh, for, for a cloud computing platform. What all that work entails, uh, if you can shed some light on that. Yeah, um, I like to. So, I like to say that it is the it is the tactical one of the most tactical C level roles you can have, right? So, there are a lot of roles that are incredibly strategic and visionary, and then you you kind of if you're sitting in a boardroom, you have all your chiefs and all your people, and everyone's talking blue sky, it's so fantastic, and then they look at the COO and they go, here, go do it. Mm. <laughs> And the CEO was like, oh my God, how are we gonna do all this, right? Um, So you end up being, it's an interesting role because you have to meet everyone's needs, Mm -hmm. not only your boards, but your your steer co, your end users, your internal users, your client, you have to meet everyone's needs, finance, ops, security, everyone, right? Um, While still meeting certain goals and while also still being a bit of the, I don't wanna say Debbie Downer, but sometimes Mm -hmm. you have to be the challenger. You have to be the one that says, listen, this this is actually not operational, right? We, you know, this is a fantastic idea, but to operate this idea, we're gonna need, you know, 30 million more dollars and 300 more people. And that's simply not a feasible task in in five to six months. And this is very hard in the world of management consulting where yes, we can do it, and the entrepreneurial spirit is always the answer. And so um, I learned I learned to say yes and a lot, which I got from a very very dodgy improv cl- class in college. <laughs> so you have to do a lot of improv because you're just kind of like yes, <laughs> yes, and we'll do it in this way and that way and the other way. So you're kind of letting them know that you're not going to do it right now, but with a very yes, we'll do it attitude. Um, so you wear a ton of hats, right? I manage the PNL, I manage the team. Um, uh, you are part of the strategic vision. You are part of the mission, but you are very much expected to also be hands on the ground and the kind of combat team um, out of out of the other board members. Interesting. Um, so I think one thing that's that's really fascinating about uh, about this trend was that uh, so typically we have seen operating officers coming out of legacy L and Bs and sort of your your uh, right. So it's it's really have I seen. Um, any uh, like uh, a, a good seasoned analytics professional tapping on to do the CEO role? What what was it like As compared to your 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 analytics and data um, sort of projects? How different and how um, like if you can shed some light on on uh, how was it experience? You mean the difference between being like a consultant and then going up in the uh, yeah? Um, it, it's it's always very hard to remove yourself from hands-on work when you're an engineer at heart. Um, and so you have to deal with the balance of delegating a lot of the work that you used to let you have a passion for, right? Still find a way to keep a hand in that work, but realize that your, you know, your job is more to find the right resources, find talent that is smarter than you, which is hard to swallow for some people, um, right? But really bring in people that will challenge you and and under and, and let you know, listen, we can do this better. And that's the way to go. Um, and it's just a lot around knowing and understanding your people, the markets, the, the way the move, you know, the way the markets are going to move, the way the, the kind of things are happening in five to six years. So my books, right? You could see that like 
when I was a when I was a practitioner, a lot of what I was reading was very tactical kind of how to you know how to write better memory efficient code in Python, mm -hmm. how to write better you know how to write better ML algorithms, these sort of things. Now I'm reading more more HBR, how to be more productive. You know the one you know the machine age and how things are working and how things are changing over time. Productivity books. So. So you're worried about how do I build the leanest and most productive team for our goal. Interesting. Um, thank you so much for sharing that, by the way. I, I appreciate that. So now, now, now let's talk about um, your current role. So if you can shed some light on what do you do now uh, with BCG and what does really principal and global technology lead mean uh, in terms of BCG? Sure. So um, uh, as a principal, that means I'm a, I'm a fairly senior consultant. I'm a couple of rungs before, uh, below our partnership. Um, so I am, I am a consultant like everyone else. Um, I have obviously an analytics and a data leaning. So those are the projects that I'm mostly focused on. And so a lot of my work is interfacing with C-level and C-minus one level executives that need to understand I'm transforming my organization. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> or I bought a data lake and it broke, right? I mean, these are the things we, we run into nowadays. So that's part of my job. And my, my, um, my other role is being CTO of our, um, of our practice, our gamma practice. So driving the strategy, vision, and mission. We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI-powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website, firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. So now, thank you so much, by the way, for, for shedding light on that and I truly appreciate that. So now let's let's talk about, um, I ask you like um, uh, your thoughts about uh, analytics at scale. Like, so what, what, what is, what do you think about, what are the essential and, and I think in, in your role as a CEO of, of Quantum Black, I think you, you shed some light on uh, on sort of thing doing things at scale. So what what do you mean by uh, what is the essentials to having analytics at scale? If you can shed some light on that. Yeah, so um, I'll be consistent. I recently gave a talk at, at Data IQ um, on exactly this topic. And so I think there are three pillars to success, technology, people, and design. Um, and what I mean by that is a lot of people think technology is the way, is the kind of core and essential piece for analytics at scale. And I, I'm actually, I, I disagree as much as I'm a technologist. I, I think that it's part of it. But the people and the organization that you need to understand, that you need to work with are your, are your, your one, your kind of first of the kind of three legs of the chair. Right? They're kind of your first of the stool. And that is because if your people don't know how to use the technology, if you cannot train and retain, if they're not excited about the mission and the vision of the company and where it's going, the tool's not gonna matter. The technology is not gonna matter. And design, if you cannot implement and create actionable analytics, they will not scale. You don't need them to scale. Right. Because if you can't explain to an executive why when he looks at his iPad or his laptop in the morning, why this little knob is turning red and what that means for him, or maybe why that color is probably not the best color because red means something else in that company, you're you, you're at a, you have a problem. That technology is also not going to work in six months. And then the third pillar is the technology, of course. Right. But so when I speak to clients, I try to help them understand, have you figured out these other two components yet? Because if you haven't, we may be going too far down the technical rabbit hole mm. without thinking about, okay, what, what does analytics mean for your organization? Do your people know what it means? Um, does it even meet your vision and your mission anymore, right? So I, I, I had a great um, analogy a couple of months back to Facebook changing its mission. Mm. I have actually not seen companies change their mission like that. I mean, I wonder how many times CEOs sit down and go, wait, wait a second. <laughs> right. Our mission's not what it was 80 years ago, right? I mean, Facebook's a lot younger than that, but look, they already changed it, right? Mark Zuckerberg said, guys, this isn't working. We need to change our mission. And this means this trickles down to everyone in the organization. So I think these sorts of things are incredibly important to the change management that allows the technology to scale and be enabled. And then you can deal with all of the other things that people think are the more complicated ones, like, oh, well, how do I build a cloud platform? And how do I scale? And I have all these data centers. And 
for me, that's an easier problem to solve. That, that's like math, hmm. right? It has an answer, it has a formula, it has an algorithm. The other two pieces are harder and involve people and their minds and their emotions and, and, and their fear of jobs in the future. And so these are the three tenets that I think we need to solve for. Interesting. So if, if, if you are given this task of, hey, let's, let's move this gut-based decision-making organization to, say, um, using analytics uh, for decision-making, what would be your like, first few steps that you would, you would uh, recommend or, or, or think about? Like, what, what would be the like, first few steps that you would, you would think? Yeah, so the first step is we probably, and I'm speaking as the company, right? Mm. We've probably been doing analytics in some way, shape, or form for mm. a long time. Let's find those people in the organization, mm. right? So if that's a bank, that's obviously people writing Excel reports. If it's a, if it's a retail, it's your marketing and sales area, your point of sale people, your supply chain. Analytics is happening somewhere. So let's first understand what analytics we have, understand the needs and the drives of the people running those units for you, and then thinking through their pain points, mm. right? So rather than try to look at what's happening outside and say, we need this brand new shiny thing because everyone else has it, what's going on within your org? So if you speak to your supply chain people, is there a bottleneck, you know, building one piece and one piece, one, one piece is too slow to get to the other part of it? You know, is that an issue? Or is the issue that your warehousing system is so slow that you don't even know how many SKUs you have, mm. you know, the day of, right? What what are those pain points? So then you end up with your, you know, then you end up with your equation, right? Then you know what you have to solve for. And then you can start doing a capability assessment. Do I need new skill sets? Can I upskill my people? Right? What what where can how do I get to having those skill sets? Once you do that capability assessment, then lastly you can start thinking about okay now what are the new what are the new pieces of tech that i either need to purchase do i need to acquire or acquire a small company are there some partnerships or vendors that i can have right so then you start your build versus buy hmm. work right so that's in it's kind of an in outward kind of thing it's 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 almost like a personal thing, right? You need to first realize you need to change as a person, <laughs> and then bring and then bring the uh, the external the external work in. Interesting. We'll resume after a short break. This part of the podcast is brought to you by First Friday Fair, fastest AI powered way to find your next opportunity. Check out the website firstfridayfair.tao.ai and find your next dream job. Let's get back to the podcast. No, I think that's 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 well said, uh, Andrea. I think I, I remember. I think last to last week, I had a conversation with one of the executive at a company, and and we, we were we were talking about maturity, like how to attain a, a a good maturity. And 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 I was talking to this gentleman that hey, you can do this, and pretty much it 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 it, it somehow you are saying the same thing. Find the find all the analytics signed within within your company. I think that's beautifully said. And what I was telling this gentleman was that hey. Every every group in your company is at some maturity, right? It's a, some is five, some is three, whatever, right? And if you can create an itinerary of who is where and what, then that could define your culture, right? If you can align, say, hey, this like this guy will be churning out uh, best practices, and so now every business can sort of compile around it. That would be sort of um, so. Uh, it's, it's fascinating that you are. Uh, thank you for 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 pointing there as well. Um, now let's let's talk about um, and and you talked about engineering first companies and I think that's that's a beautifully said and I was really yeah. that's very catchy and very clever. What do you mean by that? If you can shed some light on engineering, like why should every company should be engineering first? Yeah, so um, I think this is it's funny we kind of went bottom up a little bit right from mm. the internals of the company. This is now going in the other direction. So yeah. there needs to be an an education around engineers no longer being back office, mm. right? And mm. so y- these are the people that, you ca- that you're saying, you're, you're calling them purple unicorns, you know, you're calling them unicorn herders. I mean, you see all these crazy titles now mm. for these people you cannot find because mm. there's such, they're, they're in so much demand that they're expensive, they're buzzy, they're giving talks at conferences, yet, when a Fortune 100 or Fortune 500 
100, brings them into their company, they're not revered, right? And they're not seen as front office and they're not seen as kind of your money makers because they're not sales, they're not partners, but they are building the engines and the software that is allowing you to make that money and to allow your salespeople to not be left without, you know, excuse me, but a pot to piss on, right? right. <laughs> because if your salespeople sell something and that thing doesn't exist, you've just gotten an incredibly bad brand in the market. And so the companies that, and, and I, I see C-level scratching their head all the time. Mm -hmm. We want to be more like Amazon. We want to be more like Google. We want to be more like all these, you know, Netflix. And I'm like, well, their engineers come first. Right. Right. They listen to their engineers. Their engineers are at the steer coast. Their engineers are at boards. Their engineers come first. Right. And that doesn't mean you have to give every engineer the biggest salary in the world. I mean, there needs to be junior engineers and senior ones, et cetera. But when you have a VP of engineering or an engineering manager, um, they need to be thought of as people who can provide thought leadership, can whiteboard with with C levels and and have their their visions taken into into account and then you start becoming an engineering first organization right because then it's no longer this is our vision and our strategy go build it interesting right and so, then so that's that's i think that is going to take some time because it's just i think what's going to really and it's funny right because we're in the millennial age the, the, mm. the kind of big millennial gap of people the younger people are coming into you know senior level senior level organ organizations um we, a lot of us are engineers. A lot mm. of us are technical. It's just the way of the world. As you're going into school, you have to be more technical. So I think what may create this change is just seeing more of these younger technical engineer or they have some engineering background in senior positions, having this kind of thought. Interesting. No, I think that's that's fascinating. So so what, what, you're, what you're suggesting is that every company is using some other flavor of engineering or, or technology just utilize that and from build there try to sort of uh, extrapolate and see how the company could actually be aligned and think like an um, okay that's 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 beautiful actually um, and 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 to be very frank um, so I have a bunch of clients who are legacy old businesses and they are like oof like it's 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 very difficult for them to now think in a totally different direction of and then it's it's hard like uh, and you must you must have seen that as well like many of the companies who are not tech companies they are their whole and, and you 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 touched briefly on that supply chain companies on some of the companies which are not really right so it's um but whatever they're doing is kudos and i think you have some good suggestions that hey just see where the engineering is happening and just see if you can drive some change from there one more thing that that you you said which is very exciting was um data engineering and how people understand it wrong or, or what uh, against the common understanding what is data engineering to you? Like if, if, if you know. Yeah, this, this holds a special place in my heart because I'm going through four cases right, right now that this is exactly the issue. And you're just like, why well, don't, and you, you just can't, like it, it, it drives me mad how people don't understand that data engine. So tip, classically, I think simply because of the, not the ability of, of tech and our own, our own technical, you know, um, our own technical debt. Data engineering has been seen has been seen as people who pump data into a warehouse, hmm. right? People who take some stuff, put it into a structure table, create some EDWs and some warehouses. So hmm. every time we hear data engineering at a at a client, they're like, "Oh, we have an EDW here. We're putting it into a data lake." That's all I ever hear, and we we start to think about, well, what about breaking out your data engineering tasks into simple versus complex. And so you have things that are probably, I, I don't have a crystal ball, but I would say in five years will become very automated, right? Mm. Which is this structured data going into a structured table, this kind of stuff that you don't really need people for anymore. And then you have these kind of moderate data engineering tasks, which are a little more difficult because you have some unstructured data. Maybe it's video, maybe it's pictures, maybe it's just PDFs you're trying to convert into text. Um, and some of that is automated, but some of that needs, needs some people. And then you have complex work, which is, and, and I'll be technical here, right? And then I kind of will explain, but you have a situation where you may not even have primary keys in your tables and you mm -hmm. need to join them. 
-hmm. And you need to find some similarity between those tables, between that data, as you bring your organization's data together. That takes analytics, right? That takes data engineers who understand things like similarity scoring, k-means clustering, fuzzy mm -hmm. matching, and those are data engineers, mm -hmm. right? Those are, those are data engineers. They're just advanced data engineers with a very particular skill set. And we tell this to our clients, and their minds kind of just pop open. They're like, mm. what? We've been looking for the wrong people. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> what are we? We're, oh, my God, someone fix the job descriptions right now. Um, and, and so I, there is this, this mentality that data engineering, data science, data analytics, and they're, they're all this kind of siloed, very waterfall method. You do this, then you do that, then you do the other thing. You need a person for this and this, you know, very assembly line. When analytics and data science, they kind of all, you know, a lot of people have a similar skill set. And they can be, and, and it just depends on where they spike, right? So data scientists are pure math people, hmm. right? They can change algorithms, they can make algorithms, they can make things more efficient. You have your engineers that know how to build software, and then you have your your kind of data people that actually know how to munge and manipulate and extrapolate and and make even make new data, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think there's just this very limited and shallow understanding of what it means to use data for better and and to create a better data asset, and it's not just SQL, but. I can go on forever about this stuff. It just interesting. <laughs> it's interesting. such an issue at so many at so many clients. No, I think it's a, fascinating. Again, I think it's it's very true that um, the tree, like how we used to perceive these branches, they are evolving rapidly. And I think to many degree, I think um, I was talking to a company and their data, like their data science is well within their IT cloud. and like it's it wherever you can find right those professionals just right. just start from there and, and whatever the companies could do. I think. Very, very well said. And now, now let's talk about um, some of the challenges that that you have seen businesses make. I think since you are again a part of three consulting companies, which are pretty beefy in terms of uh, tackling data science challenges and problems uh, for many of many of big companies. So, what are from your vantage point some of some of uh, common pitfalls or common -ish problems that you saw uh, businesses making? And, and and what are some of your solutions to that? If you can shed some light on that. Yeah, yeah. So um, one of the common themes I've seen is when people want to modernize their legacy architecture, they do a kind of what I call lift and shift. So they take everything in the old legacy architecture, everything in all their old mainframes or databases, they contract or call someone to build a very fancy data lake, a very fancy Hadoop, all the fancy names you can think of and put it there. And they literally lift all the stuff and shift it over. Mm. Not good. Mm. Right? Why? Because if you have a computational background and you understand moving things that are kind of old, static, server-based, single node infrastructure to distributed infrastructure, you need to actually change the code. Cool. And so you get clients saying, we moved all our stuff and now it's slow. Our queries don't work. The data is not joined correctly. This thing doesn't match with this thing. We, so there's this kind of small piece missing where you need to redesign and re-architect for the new architecture and make sure that there's probably a lot of redesign actually needed, right? New metadata tables, this sort of stuff. That's one theme we see. Um, another that another common pitfall I've seen is what you just alluded to, this huge separation between the data component and the analytics component. Mm. So we're going to focus on all the data first. We're going to create a CDO. We're going to do data governance and data lineage and data provenance, and we're going to. It's going to be amazing. We're going to meet all the regulatory standards, and we're never going to get hacked. And then maybe we'll do some analytics. And so rather than actually find out, okay, if we have an analytics organization and a data organization, how can those two work together to meet all of our needs, right? So a perfect use case of that is using anomaly detection to meet a data regulatory need, mm. right? Um, an anomaly detection is not a data problem, it's an analytics problem. So you, you kind of have to bring those two together. Um, so that's that's a one pitfall, another pitfall. And then a third 
I think a third pitfall is something we spoke about again, is the immediate thought that you need new people. Mm. Oh, I need new people. I need lots of new people, people everywhere. Lots of, I have gaps. Everyone's stupid in my company. They're old, they're stupid, they don't know anything. And <laughs> you're just like, hold on. You know, if you have some people in back office that know how to write C++ or Java, I have some news for you. They can also write Scala and they can also write Spark because it's based on Java, mm. right? They can also write Python because it's based on C. Right. And so these are the, you can upskill your people. Now, of course, some people don't want to be upskilled, so you have mm. to manage that, but at least think about it, right? Don't freak out about the fact that you don't have these like fancy titles in your organization. They are just titles. Your people might, they might still, they might exist in your org. You don't even know it. So those are the three things I've seen. Interesting. And I think well said. And and, and from from even our one vintage point, um, people is number one. I think, and then you rightly pointed out, and, and, and I typically t tell them, hey, are you looking for data scientists or data science, right? We are, like, we have to understand between the two, right? So yeah. chasing a unicorn versus getting yourself in that mindset of, of how to right. get that. And I think I, I remember a uh, couple of years back, and, and uh, you slightly alluded to uh, that as well, like most of our interaction with anyone who say, hey, we are data we, data science. Yes, we have like 1,700 people doing data science in our company. Beautiful PhDs we have hired, and they're doing amazing work. I said, okay, what, what are they doing? And they're just dumping data and putting in Hadoop clusters. What next? <laughs> Nothing. Can you query that? No. Lake, lake, swan, yes, it is everything. Like it's ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you 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 went there as well. It's just it's just like it was ludicrous to to saying, hey, really? Like, do you have a business problem to begin with? Or I said, no, no. Now we are trying to recruit a business problem, and it's like, oh man. So yeah, exactly. it's like wow. No, no, yeah, exactly. Well, I think well said. I think this is uh, yeah. I think we 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 hear them. Now, now let's talk about some of the successful. Some of the success stories that you have you have you have heard that hey people are doing it beautifully. What are some of the tenets of what are some of the things that you picked? Hey, this is amazing. Like you don't need me. Probably I need you, or something. What are some yeah. of those, some of those those sort of thoughts? Yeah. So um, I'm a big. Um, I have a lot of friends there. One of them is my mentor. Netflix um, is absolutely. So they, you know, they take <laughs> add all the buzzy words and actually do it right so when they say when people say agile and working in a team that can only eat one pizza all these sorts of weird people are like what is that what do pizza teams even mean right what are these things netflix does this incredibly well um not only do they pay their people very well that that kind of that deserve it but their technical principles are just phenomenal right so um i took some of my own guiding principles from them on you know being a service oriented company that only thinks about building an API, right? So they could care less if they're siloed. And they have to be for certain issues, right? You have to be siloed. So they always think about what is the service contract we are creating with each other in each of our small units so that our services always work together. And that to me is the trick to a lot of scale. And people say, right, the API, right? The API is important, yes, but. If there's a, again, there's a people piece to this as well, right? So how are they communicating on a day-to-day -day basis, right? How are they sharing code? How are they making sure that their services work with one another? What are those pieces you're putting into place? And so Netflix does this very, very well. And, and I follow all of the code they write. Um, they open source a lot of their work, mm -hmm. which I think is another great tenet to success mm -hmm. and something that Legacy organizations are incredibly afraid of. Mm. They think it will completely dilute their market share. The first question we tell them when they when, when we say, what do you think of when you hear open source? They think just rev, the revenues are just red in their mind. They think we're going to lose IP. We're not going to get any traction, blah, blah, blah. So I think looking at these organizations, I mean, Netflix is obviously a very, very powerful and rich company, and they open source a lot of their work. So um, knowing what to open source and knowing what to hold close to the heart is also, I think, something that I like to look at them for. Um, Amazon is my other, my other very, very big, um, big, big company that I, I follow, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> I've met a lot of the Amazon leadership. We've worked at McKinsey and, and, and at BCG. Um, I go to their conference every year. I think 
Jeff has this, um, Jeff Bezos has this mentality of the minute you start to relax, the minute you start to think you have it under control, your, your, your company is done. Yeah. Um, and the risks that he takes uh, in, in the company and the way that he continues to instill this vision and mission through his entire organization, regardless of what some people say about the work, <laughs> the work scenario in there, right? I, 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 I won't talk about that piece. But the guiding technology principles of releasing every couple, you know, releasing every 35 seconds, making sure that, and I'm doing this at BCG as well, right? Build the tech in response to what the people are asking you to do. Mm. You know, you may not like it. It may not seem great and fancy at the moment, but if they're asking you for something, build for it. Um, and then kind of build on top of that. Um, so I, I think Amazon has been amazing. And I, so Netflix as well. Um, I don't. The only other kind of company that I'll just I'll touch on because I interviewed with them and they're they're they have a very interesting model is Goldman. Mm. So I um <laughs> funny story. So I go to interview with them uh, as an engineer, and of course they're putting me through the ringer on the whiteboard. And then I ask them, so um so what do you guys typically code in C plus plus Java? I'm like I, I do Python and C. I'm not a Java coder. They're like, don't worry about that. We wrote our own code. And I was like, okay then, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, they are very under, like undercover mm -hmm. technically advanced. It's very mm -hmm. strange. You never hear about like, mm -hmm. you kind of hear them a little bit under the hood, but they're one of the first companies to ever take on Docker Enterprise mm -hmm. and Dockerize their entire, uh, try, will try to Dockerize most of their work. Right. While B, what you would consider pretty legacy, right? right? Um, and so I try to follow them as well because I'm very curious to see how are they managing that change because they have it harder than Amazon and Netflix, right? They have traditional bankers and traditional investment banking and traditional trading and how are they managing that change and staying abreast of the, of the move, of the tech move. So, so those are the three I, I follow pretty often. Well, thank you so much for shedding light on that. I think this remind and, and regarding the, the 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 mindset divide and I, I remember um, I was talking to one of the one of the NASA's uh, uh, chief of uh, I think one of the the data science lead there and he was he was he was telling me that Vishal you know there are like two type of scientists in NASA he said one of the science one one breed is hey it's my code I designed the algorithm I'll not share I'll I pretty much I live through this and I'll probably die with this. And the, the and the new breed, they're just on social media. Hey, look at this code I just wrote, <laughs> and the code, and just going and before even asking that whether they should post that code, is it? It's it's like a it's like a it's and it's it's a, it's a massive cultural shift in NASA, and they have to respect you now both of these these verticals, and 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 they're saying that it's it's a constant challenge to sort of now being yeah. a very concealed and hey no it's a to, to pay, anyone can come in and it's a public whatever, just be an open culture. So, it's a weird, it's, it's a tricky boundary, right? Because you do have IP, IP right. exists, and you right. want to hold some IP, it's important. But, uh, but yeah, you still want to be part of the democratization of the internet and the democratization of data and making, and making people feel that things are open and they're visible. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's nice to hear it's happening at NASA too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's good. So so I think uh, one one more thing that I, I definitely want to ask you about, uh, and this is since you are coming from the tech uh, in, into business, how how is that transition? Like what what are some of the some of the challenges that you personally faced, and some of the thing that you say come pretty handy. Uh, so if you yeah. can shed some light. Yeah. Um, so I I try to think of my world as being proficient in many languages and it's tricky so if you think about technology being one and and kind of english or business being the other you're it's it's like a brain it's like a brain challenge to always be flipping the switch on and off between the languages mm. and you have to know your audience incredibly well so when you're a technologist when you're engineer an engineer and you're amongst your community you know your audience mm. Sometimes your audience is more technical than you, and so you always sound dumber, like, which is fine. Right, right. Uh, sometimes they're less technical, so you're teaching, but there's, it's levels. When you merge into a more of a broader business or executive role, your audience is across the board. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you're too techy, and sometimes you're not techy enough, and sometimes you have to be just in the middle, like Goldilocks, and you just got to be warm enough, right? And so 
this is always the challenge and where um, I myself seek to grow and kind of tune that message because that's, you know, as you start becoming a thought leader and as you start trying to keep your place in engineering and also get executives to understand and grab onto what you're saying, it becomes harder and harder because you start you start to lose grasp with the engineering. So you're like, oh, I got to like hack for a week. <laughs> I got to put my hoodie on and I got to like sit down and write like five C programs or I'm going to lose my, I feel like I'm going to like lose traction. And then for another week, I'm like, oh man, I got to read HBR for a week because I don't know what, <laughs> I don't know what marketing, market modeling is anymore. <laughs> so, you know, this, this is where, um, this is where the biggest challenge has been for me. Interesting. Interesting. And now let's, let's talk about um, some of the KPIs. Like, um, so, what are some of the KPIs that 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 you have um, whenever you put you're building a your data science practice or something? What are some of the KPIs that uh, that you you really focus on? If, like you have done it in number of time in number of consulting yeah. times. So what are some of the key like, things that you monitor? Yes. Yeah, so the one thing, well, there's a few things, right? So on the user side, we monitor traction and stickiness which is pretty common, right? But mm. um, internal and external traction are actually two completely separate KPIs. So w when I built both the, the, old, the McKinsey and now this platform, there is an internal user, which is your developer, your engineer, your data scientist, and the external user, which is your client, right? Um, and these are two very different users and they have, how are they using it? Are they, are they staying on? Um, are they falling back to their laptops and to their regular hardware? Or are they continuing to use this platform, build on it, code on it, and grow that platform with you? And then similarly with clients, this is a more typical KPI, which is, you know, are they on it for a long period of time? Are they asking for more of it? This is a very typical software as a service KPI that we that we monitor. Um, another thing that I monitor as a just as a team, as a team builder, is are our people growing with the tech and basically giving back to the platform? And so the way we think of that is we may hire some junior people, we may hire some mid-level people. How are they tracking against us building our platform? That's a big KPI for me internally as I, as I grow my people. So for example, um, at McKinsey, um, no names, but I hired a mechanical engineer and everyone was like, what? For the cloud? <laughs> Best. DevOps person ever, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And so that's a big performance indicator for me because that the way they grow and the way we build their skill sets actually is dependent on how good we build the performance of the platform. The second one is cost. Mm -hmm. Well, the third one is cost. Mm -hmm. So it's it should not be linear, right? We shouldn't be like exponentially increasing costs here. What should start to happen is we build we build, we build, it's very costly when you build because you don't know how to make it more efficient just yet. Mm. But as you start to hit six months, a year, a year and a half, you should start bringing those costs down per your user, right? Because then you should start learning how to become more efficient, writing better code, squeezing more compute power out of all your servers and bringing the costs down. So we, we start to try to see a stabilizing effect and then a, and then a, um, a, a scaling down effect on cost per, per user. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any others. I mean, there are. We've had like twenty. I have like way too many KPIs at one point. Um, trying to think. Ah, yes. Yeah. So the last, the very last one is training and enablement. So we try to make sure that our people are being upskilled continuously. And so one of the KPIs we use are: Are our people learning more? Do they? Are they going to conferences? Are we helping them? Are they taking their own self-learning? You know, are they going on Coursera, Udacity, things like that? Are we helping them do that? Um, and how can we help them do that? So Confluence, you know, are they writing knowledge docs on Confluence? Are they open sourcing if for the things we allow them to? Are they writing blogs? Are they becoming thought leaders? So that's another big KPI for us internally. Interesting. Um, now, now let's talk about hiring uh, a bit. I think, and, and you, you briefly touched that, um, like getting a mechanical guy for, for DevOps. And, and so what are some of some of your hacks when it comes to hiring? What are some of the, your cheat sheet? Um, if you can shed some light on like who to hire and what are some of the things? Yeah. Um, so the first thing is I recommend that the hiring man managers for the first week hire them, like actually recruit with the recruiters. Mm -hmm. So I've seen hiring managers take a step back a number mm -hmm. of times. I am a very hands-on hiring manager. So I source myself. 
I spend a week or two on LinkedIn Recruiter and I source, and I source profiles. Um, this is incredibly important and it actually means a lot to the recruiters because the recruiters have no idea who these profiles are. And like you, like you very well said earlier, one data scientist in one company could be a completely different person in another company. Mm. So you can't expect your recruiters to know what you mean by DevOps. You, you have to let them know. Um, another, and that's kind of more of a, a way of working that helps hire faster. A hack that I, that I usually have is, I mean, I call it guerrilla recruiting, but you just gotta go out there. <laughs> you know what I mean? You gotta go to the meetups, you have to go to conferences, you have to go with your swag, and you and as an engineer, you have to take your other engineers, you gotta take mm. your doers. Don't take the recruiters to the conferences. This does not work. <laughs> like, if they sit at a table and they say, here, fill out an application, if you are not a company with an incredible brand just yet, that will not work. But if you have a data scientist who's super cool and also ends up sitting next to someone else who's super cool and they start talking and they, oh, I would love to work where you work, blah, 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 that works better. Interesting. Um, so, you know, going around, always have your recruiter hat on. And um, we we do this inside, like we do this with our, with our people inside, right? Obviously, everyone has incentives. You hire somebody, right. you get money, blah, 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 right? This kind of thing. Um, but we we speak we, we kind of hang out we, we just give out swag we're like give these stickers out do these things do those things and they end up finding a friend who knows a friend yeah. that kind of thing um, <laughs> hiring is I'm struggling with it you know I'm struggling with it myself right now my other hack is hire junior and train them hmm. stop looking for the people that are three hundred thousand dollars a year and you know have been in the industry for twenty years. Hire junior guys that are incredibly sharp or, or, or junior girls that are incredibly sharp, have a master's or a bachelor's in CS, and train them. They'll learn, and they'll be very loyal because you gave them a shot. Right. So, um, yeah, that would be my other thing is I think we're we're a little scared to hire junior because we're all moving so fast mm -hmm. that we're like, but this no, person it's, it's, needs I to. I think it's, it's, yeah. it's well said, by the way, and, and, and I, I, to, add to add to what you just said, so we were asked to do a career fair a while back when we were putting up this community and global community together and we we're just rapidly growing and we put up this career fair and and we could have said hey i said you don't want a career fair none of this like none of the good people end up in a career fair probably and they said no 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 let's let's do it i said okay let's do it and then all the recruiters flooded that 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 event and there were a lot of interesting folks we we, we got really any hiring and there was nothing. There was like pin drop sign. I said, what the hell happened? So I we went on this interview spree. And then we said, at least get one practitioner from your company on board. So, And they say, we just presented all the cases to our hiring manager. They, they rejected it and said, okay, let's bring those guys in. And I think you are just hitting on the nail on, on, the, on, the, on the next um, session. They were like, uh, it's about, I think, seven times we get more high, like interview calls now. And said, "What the why the hell? What what the hell have changed?" And said, "Since now this guy can talk to that guy, now right. and and they end up hiring junior people because we I think one of the thing that that you need in data science is coachability because you don't even yeah. know what what you're saying half of the time. You're still trying to figure out. <laughs> so, and, and when you're at that stage, you need very smart, very coachable people because you don't know where you'll you'll end up in probably three months." So it was it was fascinating. So so yeah, I think uh, you have a very 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 interesting and good point that hire small and and sort of uh, and and I think hiring managers are the best recruiter. Even what we have seen, if you're not if you're not in the process, then probably you'll not end up hiring pretty quickly. And I think this is and yes. this has been like even our struggle when dealing with big companies. Get your one of the hiring manager in, into these sessions. Uh, they don't they don't and make they don't them show up accountable. Often. Yeah. Exactly, and make the hiring manager accountable for those for that that's headcount, a, that's, not the recruiters. That's, that's a very good point. You no, know? the recruiters are helping you. They're a tool that the hiring manager has provided, but it's kind of like the data scientist has Python or R as the tool, but the hiring manager needs to be held accountable um, because if not, it, it, they're like, oh, I don't know, my recruiters are working on it, you know, and you end up in yeah. Doesn't and, work. And and um, one thing I, I need your your, your thought on is since you, again you are coming from the from the, from the practitioner end and and sort of going into the leadership end. So now um, there and this is how I define it is art of doing. So there are two signs that run a business: art of doing business and science of doing business. Right. 
so the engineering bracket they they figure out the art of uh, like the science of doing business the business folks the creative folks they are doing the art of doing business and i think one thing that that we discuss a lot with a lot of leadership about is how smudgy is the art and the science going to right, right? because now science is saying hey you know i can do art and art is saying that hey you know i can i know how the science works because i have been selling this thing uh, through the roof so what are some of your thoughts that um, if if you let the the science uh, take over the art side of the business one that um, the next upgrade probably will make your competitive edge obsolete that's a bigger argument right so what are your thoughts um, um, if any on that yeah that's a that's a phenomenal i mean that's a phenomenal question right and i i think there are going to still be areas for pure creativity hmm. and then areas for pure science and i'll give an example so you need space to think through the blue sky hmm. right so you need you still need people that are unencumbered by quality assurance regulation and the day-to-day -day, like we need to check these boxes for this to actually happen for example look at the pharmaceutical industry i'll never see those things become smudgy between the creativity and the science because mm. if they you know no one's going to be like what if this drug did this <laughs> you know? right. i'm going to go build the drug now so i, I think there's a, a very big gap but you need you still need the ability to tell people okay this is the innovation arm of this mm. pharmaceutical company go ahead and let us know what your best and buzziest ideas are and then we will translate those into things that our engineers can understand and that's when you see the smudginess mm. that's when you see the people who can take the crazy and these wild ideas that people are thinking about and and sort of funnel them into something that a pure scientist or someone who is very very detail oriented and wants a lot of structure to understand because to me this boils down to personalities mm -hmm. i think you're going to have personalities that kind of be are a little bit in both camps right i find myself as one of those you probably are one of those right and then you have personalities that cannot deal with uh, startups, they can deal with things moving fast and things all over the place. They need super structure. And you have some people that will never work for a corporation because they hate structure. Mm. So I, I think there'll always be, there'll always be a need for both. Um, but that middle piece of the kind of translators is where we need a lot more. Interesting. Thank you so much. I think that's, that, that, that's very helpful. Um, uh, so now, now let's talk about your secret to success, right? So if, if, if we talk about one or three things that really have worked for you throughout this journey of, and which is making you so far successful in, in the thing that you endeavor to be in. So what are some of some of the tenets or some of the things that you think are uh, hacks that you can sort of give to, to our community saying, hey, these three things probably could help? Yeah, so the the first thing is to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to say this the right way because I think being, I, it's calculated risk hmm. has been, has made me, has been one of the things that have made me successful. So I'm not someone that can just leave a job or, you know, I'm not super entrepreneurial in that sense. I can just risk everything. But what's made me very successful is thinking about why am I trying to make this leap? Why am I trying to leave this job to go to this other job? What are the mechanisms and factors and what's the worst case scenario if this doesn't go my way and if the worst case scenario is not that bad then i go and that's made me successful right because i've, I've made certain risks but i haven't done them in a very flighty way um the second one has been emotional uh, just eq mm. i mean i can't emphasize enough how important it is to have eq in this day and age where personalities and social media and everyone's feelings are completely out in the open and everyone is hyper emotional. Um, it's, in, it's, it's important to, um, and, and I'll you know, keep your stuff together, right? Um, as much as you can, especially, and, and I don't like to say this a lot, but especially as a, as, as a woman in the world, hmm. um, in, in the kind of tech industry, but even as a man, right? I mean, it's, it's important to a lot of times I've learned this lesson the hard way, especially when managing a large company, a uh, large company, a large organization in a company. You 
you want to tell your people, I'm very transparent. It's one of the things that my teams like about me. But sometimes you want to walk in and go, this is all going to the crapper. This is, <laughs> <laughs> forget it. This is a mess. I'm leaving. I'm out of here. I'm taking a break, right? You can't. Right. You just can't. You have to keep it together for your team and be the person that instills faith and confidence. And that's made me successful. Even though inside I'm like, oh, my God, are we going to make it? Uh, <laughs> this sucks right now. Um, and then the third one is just a very old thing that my mom gave me, which is grit. Mm. Sometimes you just have to drive through, not around, not try to find a weird bypass that gets you there faster. It might take longer than you want it to. It might be harder. Just drive through it and it'll be fine. Interesting. Beautifully said, I think. And thank you so much for sharing that. Now let's let's talk about your favorite read that you want to share with our audience? Yeah, my favorite read of all time or right now? I read a lot. Right now, all time, whatever right you can now. share. Yeah, so I actually, I can share. Um, I think that was a And it's Principles okay. by Ray Dalio. It's pretty damn awesome. I'm halfway through. Um, it's by the Bridgewater Man. So I was actually pretty surprised. I, it was recommended to me uh, by someone who found it, recommended by, um, I can't remember her name right now, but, but someone on LinkedIn. And they're like, oh, my God, you got to read this book. It's crazy. And it's just, it's very, very, very good. Um, so this, in combination with my HBR, is always on my table. Yes. <laughs> always. And it's very funny because look at this month's. The overcommitted organization. Oh, yeah. I feel like <laughs> sometimes I read these titles and I'm like, oh, my God. And then under <laughs> it is how to avoid team burnout. And I'm like underlining every single every single line. So those are my two reads right now. I think that that that's a perfect segue into uh, I think I, I was discussing with you before the interview about Rise and Think. I think that's uh, so what exactly is that if you can share with the audience? Yeah, so I, I, I mean, the only, I guess, piece I can share with the audience on that one is um, in this day and age, we, we haven't challenged enough our levels of productivity. I think we've stuck with, I have to work 12 hours a day, I have to work 18 hours a day. If I'm super successful, it's because I work all these hours. And I, I myself am working on this, right? But sometimes I've noticed that if I, if I work a number of hours, but I work in 20 minute spurts and then I take a break to walk outside or work in half an hour spurts. And it's funny because I start thinking about, it's like, it's almost like Tabata mm. or Plyo in fitness, right? Mm. You're doing these very, very short spurts of intense action and then relaxing intense action and then relaxing these kinds of, these kinds of things. I end up being 10 times more productive in five hours than I am. If I'm just at my computer for 12 hours, um, and Rise and Think is an organization of mine which tries to help organizations rethink this way of productivity, not in, hey, everybody get a standing desk, right. but actual behaviors that you can change little by little that enable you to do this, right? So, um, so I, I think it's, yes, yeah, again, right, how to avoid burnout in an, in, an, in an era where we're trying to squeeze as much as we can out of every employee we have. That's, I think that's that's fascinating. I think uh, I was I was talking to uh, one of the one of the Apple executives uh, about the, the, the one of the watch team and uh, the health one, and and they shared the frustration on on that as well. And I think they're doing a phenomenal job. And kudos to Apple, by the way, on that because I think they have been they have been on this mind trick of hey, people need to detach experts, and 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 I'm I'm like I'm, I'm amazed that. Uh, you have been working on that problem, and it's, this is this is beautiful. So, um, Andrea, again, it, it, it's a, it's a delight uh, um, having a conversation with you on about sort of interesting interesting topics. So, now we are almost at the close end of, of the session. So, do you have any 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 closing remark or parting thought for our audience um, that you want to share? Um, first of all, it's, this has been fantastic as well. So, thank you. I think the only closing remark I would have is to to, to just stay as hungry as you can in the world of tech, right? Um, one of the things that gives me inspiration, I like to do it every now and then, is I actually look at the list of all the startups on Y Combinator. 
that are very new and haven't even come out yet. And it's Y Combinator, as you know, funds event ventures from e every end to every end. So for example, last night I was on there and I found a credit card company that's no longer using credit card numbers, a new kind of training for just your kneecaps. Don't even ask. I don't know what this means. <laughs> But it is the most just it, it's just exhilarating, right? Because you see where tech is going. So Good. stay hungry, you know, fight for more. And um, I mean, no matter what part of the world you come from, where you started off, what kind of family you had, I think um, it's all possible. Awesome. With that, um, thank you so much, Andrea, uh, for spending time with our audience. I uh, love to have you back anytime you want you want to share any story. You're always welcome. Uh, thank thank you. you. Thank you so much. And um, as, as, as you rightly said, stay stay hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. I'll talk to you soon. Talk to Bye you now. Bye. Bye. Uh, I thought I was sick of home, but actually I was homesick. Never really knew that I would have to grow up so quick. I'm so uncomfortable, don't know anybody here. Just a couple dudes that I met once, that's it. That's it. And I go into the booth feeling nervous. Got butterflies in my stomach like I'm so worthless. Is the mic on? I don't know how to work this. Inside I'm breaking down, I hope I'm not up on the side.